Well, hello, Milwaukee Covenant Church friends and family. Uh, welcome to our service today. Uh, I hope that your week was good. Uh, I know there's been some more crazy stuff happening uh, in our nation. Um, but as we just keep saying, God is still on his throne and he is still is in control. And that's where our hope lies. Uh, so with that, let's worship today. Count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. I count on one thing. Count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me Working all things out, you're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will, and I choose to pray. Glorify, glorify the name of all names That nothing can stand against And I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name of all names That nothing can stand against And yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name For joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will, and yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I Be my 
my everything, be my everything. God, in my hoping, there in my dreaming, God, in my watching, God, in my waiting, God, in my laughing, there in my weeping, God, in my hurting, God, in my healing, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything. Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. You are everything. Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. You are everything. Be my everything. Be my everything. Be my everything. Be my everything. You are everything. It's been a crazy week. Last couple days, everything has been going on in our, nationals ca our national capital. Uh, certainly has been on all of our minds. And just when we thought we were through some of these things, big events happen. So I don't know what's going on with you and the cusp and the aftermath of the Christmas holiday, but uh, I don't know about you, but Christy, Greg, and I, we've sat and talked a lot about it. And... Um, we just, uh, we want to pray today as a pastoral prayer focused in upon praying God's peace and knowing that he is the refuge and our strength and ever-present fortress in times of trouble. And so I'm going to read from Psalms 46. Me, we, you might commonly remember that verse. We preached on it before, be still and know that I'm God, but it's full of some amazing truths about God that is useful for, for teaching and at times like this. The verse, the chapter, is 11 verses, and it's, it's compartmentalized a little bit and it goes through a few verses. And then it comes to a time and it says, Selah. And I remember my mom, I asked that question to my mom one time. Mom, what does that mean? And she says, it's kind of like an amen, but even more particular. It's a time when you just pause and think. Think about what has just been said. So as I, re as I pray through Psalms 46, I'm going to pause for a moment. I'm going to fill in a little bit more uh, in our time of prayer, and then we'll go to the next section. So with that, if you have that passage in front of you, you can open up your Bible to Psalms 46. But I'm going to read it, or more importantly, I'm going to pray it. Join me. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Father, it seems like Day in, day out, we come across good days and we come across days that challenge us, sometimes to the core of our being. And Father, we lift up uh, a time like this. 
through all the, the wonderful, beautiful aspect of the Advent season. And when we celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus Christ. And as Mary said, when she was told that she was with child, and she says, man, that can't happen. But later on, she says, nothing is impossible with God. And Lord, that's what we hold on to. Nothing is impossible with you. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. Father, we lift up our nation. We lift our political system and all that's encompassed there. We pray your direction and safety upon our nation. Lord, we pray for direction in the new leadership that's coming in um, in the United States. We pray that you might guide and lead and bless. Lord, that the collective nature of two different parties can come together with some semblance of commonality um, to help us in the days ahead. Great wisdom is needed. Phenomenal patience is required, but great anticipation on what you can do in the midst of our, our, uh, our world, not just our nation. So Lord, we thank you for the, the promises that are laid in with Psalm 60 or 46 and says that nations are in uproar and kingdoms fall, but you are in the midst of it. You are there to hold and to uphold and to bring peace. The Lord is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease on the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in all the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And so, Lord, in our time of prayer and petition, we seek your will. We seek your guidance and we seek your peace. In your most holy name, amen. nothing to give. We have nothing to give that didn't first come from your hands. We have nothing to offer you which you did not provide. Every good perfect gift comes from your kind and gracious heart. And all we do is give back to you what always has been. breath that you gave us to breathe to worship you to worship you and we're singing these songs with the very same breath to worship you to worship you Lord we're breathing the breath to breathe, to worship you, to worship you, and we're singing these songs with the very same breath, to worship you, to worship you, who 
that's given to you that it should be paid back to him who has given to you as if you needed anything from you and to and through you come all things oh lord and all we do is give back to you what always has been
would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your love. No place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love, here in your Hey kids and families, welcome. I'm really glad to see you this week. So I want you to imagine with me what would happen if I came over to your house someday after we all are vaccinated and aren't worrying about COVID and you have some friends over and I come over and I bring you a nice cake. And I'm like, hey, I brought you a cake, right? And so you pull out a knife and you start cutting up slices and you give a slice to one friend and you cut a really big slice maybe for some friend that you're really close to and, and you're cutting it all up and then all of a sudden it's all gone and you gave it all away and I didn't get a piece and I was the one who brought it over and gave it to you. And then I'm like, well, I kind of wanted some cake too, but... All of us know what it would feel like to be left out and not get a piece of the cake that we brought. Now, I wanna to talk to you not about cakes actually, but I wanna to talk to you about time. Because every day we have 24 hours of time. And so that means, if you know how to tell time, that means the hour hand goes around the clock two times. And so we have the choice of filling up our time in certain ways, and some ways we don't necessarily have a choice about. One way that we spend a third of our time in life is sleeping. So if you think about how we fill up our, our cake of time, a big piece goes to sleeping. So let's say you sleep and then, and then you wake up in the morning and so you probably have to like, you know, get ready that looks like it's gonna fall. Get ready for school or something. So we'll have a little slice of time that you spend getting ready. Um, and then after that, you're probably doing school, right? And I don't know exactly how many hours you spend during, during doing school, but I bet it's a pretty good chunk of school and homework. And um, I don't know what it's like at your house, but at my house, usually then there also had to be some time for chores. I had to like fold the laundry or clean the bathroom and clean up my room. And then there's all sorts of other things that we do with our time. I mean, things like um, eating, we eat meals with our family and uh, maybe we spend some time watching some YouTube, right? Some videos. Uh, we spend some time playing with friends. Maybe we uh, go to the grocery store with our parents and we do something and, and before you know it, our time's so full that we can't even fit all of the things that we wanted to do. And when I think about the time that we have in our life, I think it's really important to think about who we're giving all of that time to. Is the time just all about me and what I want to do? Or am I offering some of that time to God? Because we, we know that God's the one who gave us our life. He's the one who gave us time. And so we don't want to have him be the one that doesn't get a slice of the cake of, of the time of our life, right? So I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how Jesus, when he was alive on earth and he was the son of God, he had such a good relationship with God the Father. And yet Jesus himself always, no matter how busy he was, we always hear these parts of the Bible of Jesus 
waking up early in the morning before anyone else was awake and going to somewhere quiet to spend time talking in prayer with the Father. Or Jesus going and finding some, some place to rest and talk with the Father. For Jesus, it was very important that he have some time every day that he gave to God the Father to spend time in fellowship with him. And what I hope is that you can start right now. You don't have to wait until you're a grown-up. You can start right now making sure that you are giving God a part of your time every day. You're probably not going to give him eight hours like maybe you're sleeping and probably not six hours like going to school. But if you can spend maybe five or 10 or 15 minutes a day telling God what you're thankful for, telling God what you're afraid of, asking God to be with you today and to help you live the way he wants you to live, that is going to be a beautiful gift to God, giving God a piece of your time, just like Jesus gave. So I want to encourage you to give God a piece of your time, but I also want to encourage you, now that I've made this whole, whole graph of time here, to not just think about time like, okay, there's sleep time and school time and play time and video time and outdoor riding the bike time and oh, and then there's time for God too. Because we do want to spend some time intentionally, intentionally focusing in with God. But also, I want to encourage you to think about how even when Jesus wasn't alone somewhere praying, the life that he was living he was in living it for God the Father the whole time. When he was talking with his disciples, when he was teaching people, the things that he did every day, healing others, all of the things that he did were things that he was doing for God. And there's a verse in the Bible that my mom had me memorize when I was young, but I still remember. And it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as if you're working for the Lord, not for other humans. And so that reminds me that when I sleep, I can invite God into that time. I can, before I go to sleep, say a little prayer and just say, God, help me to rest in you tonight. Help me to have dreams that are the dreams that are going to encourage me in good ways. When I wake up and I'm getting ready, I can be singing along with worship songs when I am working at school or riding my bike or playing with friends, all of those things, I can say, God, how can I play in a way that honors you? How can I study today in a way that honors you? So you each have 24 hours in your day, and I am encouraging you to make sure you give God a part of that time and that you invite him into all of the time in your day. I will see you guys next week. Again, thanks. It's a privilege to be in front of you today. And uh, as Greg and Chrissy and I, have, uh, we've, we've had a good time. But hey, let's just get something straight. We miss being here in worship together. There's nothing like looking out at the congregation, uh, some asleep, some awake, and some in canatonic state, but coming together and worship God. And, you know, and walking in and out of the, the worship service in the sanctuary is just a positive uh, experience. So, golly, I'm looking forward to that time when we can be back together. So, anyway. Hey, we're jumping in the, really the cusp of a new series. And last week we talked a little bit about how you make God look good. And I, you know, that's kind of a challenging thing and maybe it takes you back a little bit and saying, me? What are you talking about, Bill? No, really. That in Isaiah it says that I form them to be my glory. And to, uh, it's not just to accept the glory of God, but it's also to convey it. It's not just to receive it ourselves, but once we get it, we need to share it. It's like one person said, in fact, I think it was Lori Ryan a couple years ago when we were in a missions meeting. She says, and maybe she took it from a book, says, we are blessed to be a blessing. And so that's a bit of what we're moving into. How do we make God look good? You might kind of say, or how do we look 
make God look better. That's kind of a challenging statement. You have some theological issues right there. But you know, as we are blessed, we can activate our life to be part of God's blessing that shares it with other people. So that's what we're going to be talking today. I'm going to open up a passage of scripture in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. And when I think about this passage, in fact, I have it written in my book, my Bible, the answer book, much like We've uh, said this last year, we had a favorite verse series that people would give their favorite verse, whether it be Psalms 23 or John 3.16, there's a variety of them, and I would preach on it. But this is one that I identify with a good friend of Kim's and mine. His name is Mike. And I still remember when she, he was leading our Bible study, when we were back, before we were in seminary and back in Washington. And this was his passage. I will always remember, that, remember it. Since then, this is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Here it is. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And then verse 2. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Father, guide us today as we go through this text. And Lord, that we uh, look at ways that we can emulate your glory to other people. And so, Lord, bless us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a little uh, paper I I saw, I read, talking about you are blessed. So read it with, or listen to it as I read it. If you own a Bible, you're blessed. Yeah, okay. But here's the catch. One-third of the world's population doesn't even have one volume of the Bible, or one copy. We've got many. Um, If you woke up today with more health than not, you're blessed, because apparently a million people won't make it through the week. If you've never experienced battle, war, the agony of torture, the pains of starvation, you were blessed, because 500 million people now, today, can't say that. If you attend church today, even if it's virtual, without arrest or harassment, torture, or even death, three billion people in the world don't have that luxury. If you have shelter, clothes, a place to sleep, food, water, clean water, you are blessed because 75% of the world's population can't say that or doesn't have that. Here's another great one. If you have money in the bank, Money in your pocket and change in some place, like in a cup in your house. You are at the top 8% of richest, the richest people in the entire world. And you are blessed. So you're blessed. So what are you going to do with it? You know, as I said, as I started out with that passage of scripture of Psalms 43, Verse 7, it says, whom I created for my glory is that God has created you to emulate his glory to other people and people around you and your family and around your neighborhood and, and just life in general. So how do you make God look good? Or maybe this, how can you make God look better? Not that we can change his stature and his character, but How can you make God look better as people see him through and in you? The statement I used last week, it says, Life situations, wars and disagreements, crisis, pandemic, craziness in our government system right now, it has a way of camouflaging God's greatest gift to us, and that's his glory. And so that's what we're going to talk about in our series. When when I started it last week, and I looked out, I've I've led a a couple Bible studies, and we covered up this we covered this topic. And this first time that I preached on that from Isaiah chapter forty three, and the the three times that I've identified it in the last six months, three was in a three two of them were in Bible study, and one of them I preached the full sermon. I've never had people respond so positively. Um, in probably any series or any passage that I've led and read and preached on. And I wonder why. 
You see, sometimes we do, I, I think what happens is we don't think about, we always think about people around us that, man, they look good. Man, Christy and Greg, they just knocked out of the park here. They did really good in, in leading us in worship in the children's message. And you'd say, man, they can do some wonderful things. Pfft, me, uh-uh, not me. I, I, I'm, I'm a good spectator. No, the truth is, is that you are a blessed. You are blessed so that you can be a blessing to others. And so... I want to enter into this series of looking at three different things in the next three weeks, including today, that focuses in on how we can make God's glory shine brighter in our life. And the first thing that we're going to talk about, in fact, what we're going to talk about this week is time. I came across a poem about time, and it says this. It's called The Value of Time. I'll read it. <clears throat> One hour. The value of time, one hour. Ask lovers who are waiting to meet. The value of time in just one minute. Ask a person who has just missed the train. The value of time in one second. Ask a person who just avoided an accident. The value of time in a millisecond. Ask the person who just won the silver medal in the Olympics. A millisecond that separated him or her from getting the gold metal. You know, one of the things about time is we can make more money, or at least we think about it. We think about making more money, but you can't make more time. And so one of the greatest resources that you have to make God look good and look better, in other words, when I say that, remember I'm talking about allowing his glory to shine through you. One of the most powerful resources you have in order to do that is time. And I'm going to give you four points, four ideas on how you take the value of time and make it worth more so that it might be used in such a way to show God's glory. Yesterday is a history. Tomorrow is a mystery. And today is a gift. What are you doing with today? The time you have today. When you think about all through Scripture, and from the Old to the New Testament, we see a whole myriad of people that have given their time in such powerful ways that change the lives of people around them, and, and sometimes the lives of the world. And it was incredibly because, incredible thing because they gave their time. Think about Joseph. In Genesis chapter 37 through 50, I don't know if you know the story, he went from Riches to rags, back to riches. He uh, was uh, kept his father goats, and his father dressed him in the loudest coats. His brothers didn't like him, so they threw him in a well. And it says, Joseph went to uh, uh, heaven, and his brothers went to Egypt. Anyway, so that's the story or a song that I learned years ago. But, you know, he gave his time, really ultimately his patience too. In such a phenomenal way, and in fact, in chapter 50 of Genesis, verse 20, it says, and he said to his brothers, he says, you intended something for evil, but God intended it for good. God used that, his situation in such a way to bring glory to him and to the people around him. Noah was a boat builder. You know, he, he car carried on uh, humbly, and um, he gave his time, and look what happened. Job showed great patience and trust in the midst of the time that he had. Uh, the boy that had a lunch, you know, the miracle, and think about what happened. He gave uh, the time, and you know, he probably wanted to go fishing instead, but he sat around and let him use his lunch and fed 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people. The Samaritan woman showed how Christ reached out to anybody and everybody, and then she ended up sharing with other individuals, the things that happened to her. You know, God does some good work. And what he, how he does that is he utilizes not only individuals, he utilizes you, but he utilizes the time that we give him. Tricia, our new uh, secretary, Chris, she's been around for a while. She's the new boss in the office. She came up right after the bat. She came up with a great idea. Great ideas for the staff to send out a Christmas card to everybody. 
And so we did that. And so what, and she came up with a great idea. She goes, what about taking all these people, the, the Stampin' Up! girls, in fact, it sounds like a, a rodeo group, uh, singers or dancers, but what they do is they, they create and they make cards, uh, green cards. And so they, <clears throat> I asked and they volunteered to give us some of those and, and we sent them out to you guys. We signed them and put a little note about what's going on in Christmas and, and you were blessed. Hopefully you were blessed. I was blessed. I was blessed doing it. But one of the things I want to say today, I want to give you four, four items that focus in upon how you use your time in such a way for God's glory to be shined, to shine through you. And number one, as we find in that passage of scripture, it says, set, I've always focused just on chapter three, verse two of, of uh, Colossians. It says, set your, your mind on things above. But in the verse before that, it says, set your heart on things above. You know, the word that's used there <clears throat> is a, uh, it's a, a pretty, you know, it's an active word. It's an imperative that it's a command, but then also it's a present tense, which says that we need to continue to do this in such a way. It's not just doing it once. It's getting in the mindset that this is a priority of my life. And the priority is this, is of making available the time and realizing the time can be used of God in such a way that sometimes we may not even realize how he's using it. But he does set your mind. You know, when, it's, when you have something going on important tomorrow, like getting up for work, you set an alarm. Um, I think about important things when I would set alarm. If I'm going fishing as a little kid, as a young boy, I would set an alarm to go fishing. You know, sometimes it would go off and man, I was excited, I'm ready to go, but you don't want to miss it. See, that's the thing about making your, the availability of your time. You can't get more of it. You can just make it available. Sometimes we need to come in with a mindset that God, you can use me any way you want. Have you ever asked that question or posed that statement to God? Uh, probably, maybe, but how many times have we meant it? To set your mind that God can use your time. The second thing that I think is just as important, maybe even more so, is giving it a priority. Making that time a priority of how you can be used of God. I've had, uh, when I was in seminary and high school and grade school, I can think about some of my favorite teachers. In seminary, one of my favorite teachers was Dr. Darius Salter. He was a hit. We had him for preaching class and pastoral theology, and there's a couple of classes also. And he wrote a book, and I, man, anyway, Darius Salter ranks right up there, one of my favorite teachers. His book I loved. It was a lot of statistics, but it really came to the whole head in the last couple paragraphs of the book, and I'll never forget it. <clears throat> very meaningful. The other thing is he loved basketball, and I like to do basketball. I had an evening class with him out in Northwest uh, Nazarene, and the big church, they had a basketball hoop and a basketball court, and so he and I would play one-on-one, -on -one, full court, after class at like 10 o'clock at night, uh, and it was, it, was, it was great. In fact, I saw him um, I contacted him when he moved out to Kansas City and he was teaching out there at a college. And, um, and he says, I, and I called him up because we were living out there. And I said, hey, do you remember me? And he goes, oh yeah, Bill, I remember you had a sweet shot from the back. I had to throw that in. But he, I remember that we used to play basketball and I, yeah, it, was, it was a lot of fun. But he also was a phenomenal preacher. And man, we all wanted to preach like Darius Salter. And he was entertaining. But the thing that I remember most of him is one day in class, he said, you have all the time in the world to do whatever you want to do. Well, like an idiot, I challenged him on that. And I said, oh, wait a bit, excuse me, how do you understand? Come on that. And he goes, well, Bill, what do you want to do today? Well, it's a sunny day. We're out. We can see the Willamette River 
It was, in, it was by our campus. And, and I said, I'd like to be out there water skiing. He says, and go water ski. I said, I can't. Well, why not? I said, because of this class. Well, if you really want to water ski, you can go do it. And it went on bantering back and forth. And I finally just put up the white flag and I surrendered. And I realized that it was the issue of priority with our time. You know, we can set our mind on things above. We can set that God can use us. I want to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want him to be able to use me. And not that I need, yeah, I guess I need to give him the okay to go ahead and do that. But it needs to be a higher priority in our life. How are you at that? So the first issue is set your mind to realize that God can use my time. This, the second is to realize it's a, put a high priority that God can use my life. And the third thing is realizing and keeping your eyes open for the opportunities that God will present to you and then you use your time accordingly to, to uh, show his glory and to work for him. Or sometimes just the opportunity that when we're just cruising through life, things happen because he's always up to something. You know, I've thought about this before. You know, taking there's people that have done taken some great opportunities and done some phenomenal things. Think about, um, when. well, let me think about that for a minute. What about the opportunities that maybe we have missed? Or think about those in Scripture that did some amazing things, and what about if they said, mm, I don't think so, I don't want to do that. Think about Mary, mother of Jesus. And the angel came to her and said, you're going to be with child, and and la da da, and he will be great, and you'll be the mother, you know, all, all that stuff. And can you imagine if all of a sudden Mary says, mm, I don't think so? What about David in 1 Samuel chapter 17? And he saw the giant, and he goes, Nah, that guy's a little bit too big for me. I don't, I don't want to hit him. I don't even want to try. Think about Noah said, You know, Genesis chapter 6, <laughs> you want me to build a boat? <laughs> right. <clears throat> You know, I don't think I want to do that. I've never built a big ark before. Think about the little boy that was cruising down in Mark chapter 14, uh, Matthew chapter 14, excuse me, and had the lunch. And he was probably going to go out on a hike. He was probably going to go down to the river and go fishing. Maybe he had an argument with his brother, and he thought, man, I just need to get away for a little bit. And all of a sudden they said, hey, buddy, can we use your lunch? Nah, I've pre it's my favorite type of fish. It's my favorite bread. Uh, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think so. What about Peter? Mark chapter 1, when Jesus says, um, come follow me and I want to make you fishers of men. Can you imagine Peter saying, no, I like to catch the little tilapia or whatever it is, the grunion or whatever, the fish they were catching. I don't think, I, I'm, I'm happy what's going on. You see, what about if they would have missed those opportunities? But you know, I'm thankful that they didn't miss those opportunities because it says in Luke chapter 2 that God's glory filled the earth. It says, we read in 1 Samuel chapter 17 that people were saved. In Genesis chapter 6, it says God's glory and his, rain, the, his promise to never flood the earth again was out there and saved humanity. The little boy in Matthew 14, that 5,000, over 5,000 were fed. And think about all the, the thing, all the people that were healed and came to faith through the ministry of Peter because even though sometimes they may have felt like he was being, they were being inconvenienced, but you know, they didn't look at it because they had set their mind that they were going to be used of God. Mary says, may it be as you have said. And all the other people, they put a priority up there that God could use, their, use them in, in significant ways. And they saw the opportunity of how God could work. And then <clears throat> the last part from set God your time. Make it a priority. 
Keep your eyes open for the opportunities of how he's working through you and how he's working in you. And may, he has the opportunities out there for you to step in and, and help out. And number four is we need to trust God that he can make it happen. It's like in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, as I've mentioned several times the last Advent season, this last Advent season, for nothing is impossible with God. You see, trusting God, that God is always up to something. We use that acronym all the time. Um, and he always has, we can trust him that he always has something going on. To set that time, to get, make a higher priority in our life with our time. To realize and look for the opportunities and trust God that something's going to happen. Let me close with this story that I, I may have shared years ago. I was, uh, it was my first quarter in seminary, and uh, Kim was living up in Washington. I was the first quarter, and I was down here in uh, Oregon, and um, I would ride the bus up to see Kim on the weekend before she, she moved down, and I got on the bus. A friend of mine from school uh, dropped me off at the bus station, and we were taking a thing called hermeneutics, and... I'm not going to get into what it was, but it was a seminary class. And I was just getting on the bus. I had this bright red shirt, a short sleeve shirt. It was the summer of fall time. And I said, hey, Rick, uh, pick me up on Sunday night. I'll come back, and then we can study hermeneutics. I get on the bus. I sat down. All of a sudden, this guy sat. He came right up to me. And he goes, you're a seminary student. And I'm going, man, is that the, you know, the mark that's on my forehead or something like that? And I said, yeah. And, well, Lo and behold, he was a pastor of a small church down in Northern California. And he was telling me his story. I was telling mine. And his story was such as this. He was coming up because he was visiting his parents. He hasn't seen, he was going to visit his parents. He hasn't seen them for a long period of time. And his dad was, well, his dad probably wasn't going to be here very much longer. Very deathly ill. And he didn't have the money to fly, and he thought, well, the best way I can go is I can take the train all the way up to Seattle and then take the ferry across to Bremer, this little place, this little town, and then walk a couple miles to their house. And I said, really? He goes, well, I go ahead. And he goes, I don't know what's going on because I'm supposed to be on the train, but the train was delayed. And so... The conductor said that I could go and transfer my ticket to the bus, Greyhound bus station. They're down in downtown Portland. So I did that. But I, it's not going to get me in until almost midnight. And then I don't know what I'm going to do. The ferry's probably not going to run. I'm going to have to stay in the ferry terminal overnight. So I don't know what to do. And I said, well, tell me this place where your parents live. And he goes, well, it's in this little town called, I don't know what, he didn't remember what it was called, but it's a little town in, in Bremerton, I think he said. And he, he thought he recollected that. And, and I said, well, where do they live? And he was describing the place. And I said, really? And I said, how about this? How about I take you, or my, my wife is going to pick me up at the train station, or the bus station in Tacoma, which is not quite to Seattle, and how about we drive you to your house? Because his parents live no more than a mile from where Kim and I had our house in Bremerton. And you know, that's how God works. Amazing ways. You see, when we set, how, how do we make God look better? How do we show his glory more? Is when we establish ourselves and set our, our time in such a way that we make it a priority to say, God, I'm going to be looking for opportunities of how you can work. And I'm going to trust, trust you that it's going to happen in amazing ways. Man, I hope you join me in a quest of making God look better. Again, I don't want to offend you for that statement, but basically, I want to make God's glory shine even brighter because, and all of us together, because we set our time and we give him our time. 
we make a higher priority to give him our time. We look for opportunities of how we can help out and maybe trusting him that maybe we don't even recognize those opportunities, but he takes them and he uses them in a powerful way so that as we are blessed, we can be a blessing to others. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for this time, this promise. And we thank you for all those people in scripture that we read about that if, you know, they, they set a high priority of giving their time to you. Lord, I pray that we can not be as selfish, but also be in anticipation of how you can use us in significant ways when we give you our time. In Jesus we pray, amen.
nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just Well, thanks again for taking your time to worship with us uh, virtually. You know, you think about where we were just, golly, it was probably 10 months ago that we started in this. And uh, thanks to Greg and Christy putting together the technology so that we can come and we can still be here together. Um, in fact, it's still growing. Watch for your emails because we're going to be live streaming here in the kind of near future. That's a relative uh, term, but uh, we'll see what how that works. Um, look for also your emails because we're going to be doing some information about our annual meeting, um, and that should uh, suffice. Uh, but again, thank you for coming and joining us in worship. We still have space if you want to venture in to uh, socially distance a worship service here in in the sanctuary on Sunday morning. We watch the music, and then I preach live. Uh, so you're welcome to join us. We do have space for some more. So anyway, uh, that kind of suffice for uh, everything going on. But again, thank you for joining us uh, together. You know, one of the things, even in the midst of, gosh, it seems some terrible things that have happened in our society in, in the recent days, actually it goes on for quite some time. But Scripture tells us that the God who is able to do immeasurably more through his strength will guard and protect us and guide us in his holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace in his name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Together, God's people said, Amen.